A very good afternoon to everyone. I'm Jinmin, MSX student, and together with the rest of the CASI leaders, a very big welcome to all of you here today. I think many of us are keenly interested in issues that intersect between businesses, government, and society. We want more effective governance so that corporations and institutions can better contribute to the greater good. This is exactly what the Corporations and Society Initiative, or CASI, is about. Growing and strengthening this community of people, deepening our awareness and exchanging ideas amongst us. So we are therefore very happy to put together today's event, Power and Politics in Banking, to explore banking crises, bailouts, failed regulation, and the role of the central bank. On our panel is Kevin Walsh, who, if I'm not mistaken, at 35, was the youngest person appointed as Federal Reserve Governor in 2006. He was deeply involved during the 2008 global financial crisis and served as the Fed's representative to the G20 and to emerging and advanced economies in Asia. Since leaving the Fed in 2011, Kevin has advised many companies and institutions, including issuing an independent report to the Bank of England proposing reforms to UK monetary policy. He is currently a member of the Group of 30, a global body of distinguished economic and financial leaders. Joining us today is also CASI's faculty director, Professor Anat Admati. Anat has been a strong advocate for financial and banking reform. Her 2013 book, The Banker's New Clothes, became a call, of, call to arms for reformers globally. In 2014, Time magazine named Anat one of the 100 most influential persons in the world. We are glad today to also be celebrating the recent launch of Anat's new and ex expanded edition of The Banker's New Clothes. Our session is moderated by GSB professor Amit Saru whose research on corporate finance has been used by US and international regulatory agencies, including the Fed Reserve and the IMF, and featured in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times, just to name a few. Amit was also previously named by the IMF, IMF as one of the top 25 economists under 45. I can think of no better panel for today's discussion, so don't hold back. Please pose them all the questions that you have been dying to hear. And before I hand, hand over to Professor Amit, please join me in welcoming our panel. All right. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to moderate this session. Uh, the title is Power, Politics, and Banking. And uh, maybe by the end of the discussion, we'll see why politics matters, or maybe we'll arrive to a conclusion that maybe it matters the most. Uh, we'll see where we get. So what I have uh, as a plan is I want to pose a few issues to both Anath and Kevin and see where we go from there. And then at some point, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, I'm cognizant that Anath has a new book. Uh, it's an expanded version of a book which was uh, the, uh, named as a best book by Wall Street Journal and Financial Times in 2014. Uh, so I want to cover all the topics that broadly are discussed in the book. That's going to be my endeavor. But while we are doing it, we'll cover many of the issues which I think are pretty central to the topic of what the panel is. So that's going to be the plan. So uh, let's get started. Anath, uh, let me cold call you first. Uh, you know, you uh, are a very famous economist who has done theory early in your career, Theory for students uh, who might not be familiar is a bunch of Greek symbols, uh, writing equations, coming up with models. Uh, when we teach uh, our MBA students about finance, you rarely see the word politics used. Uh, uh, and uh, you wrote models early in your career where I didn't see any notion of politics mentioned. Uh, and yet here you are, you've written a book which is all about politics uh, in banking. So what happened? H how did this switch happen? Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. And thanks, Amit, very much for uh, agreeing to moderate this. You're the perfect moderator because both of you and I uh, became very aware of the politics, even though we weren't trained uh, to really uh, see see it as much as we did. So the book is actually mostly teaching uh, the economics of banking, but it has politics, and in the new part, it has more politics. Uh, because in the decade since we wrote the book, uh, we learned ever more, and we already knew it when we wrote it first, 
that it's kind of all politics, as they say, and that what we were seeing could not be understood from the field of economics alone. And it's not just even political science, it's, it's other fields of the social sciences. I mean, it's, it's, it's social psychology, it's sociology, it's, it's a lot of fields uh, that play out in why we are here. I basically, I sometimes say I fell in a rabbit hole, and it's true. It's a rabbit hole, banking, uh, from the perspective of an economist who understands corporate finance. Um, and that's what happened to me. And it, what, the reason it happened to me is because we had a financial crisis and it kind of called to my attention um, what is going to, to try to figure out what's going on. Financial I, crisis or when? Because many, many people are young. 2007 to 2009. Yeah. I know it was many, fresh many in people people's no mind, idea. but your children, yes. many of you in the rooms, yes. a few people here uh, do remember it for, as adults. Uh, but it was kind of, it was a very big deal. This morning uh, we had our, our guest in class and, and we're all adjusting our talks to students as a, you know, distance. Uh, uh, you know, increases from that time, and our students were in, you know, a more elementary school, middle school, you know, et cetera, versus, you know, having just experienced it as adults, which was more in the, a decade ago or, you know, 2010, 2011, 2014 even. Um, anyway, so, so we're kind of older. Uh, anyway, so I, somebody who's been in finance, who's been teaching corporate finance for 25 years, uh, wanted to see what happened because I was teaching my students that finance is a wonderful part of the economy that helps the economy be what it is, taken pretty much for granted that, you know, there, there are rules, there are contracts, everything is enforced, you can collect your debt, all the stuff that we postulate works. And all of a sudden the system implodes and it's all these bailouts and stock prices imploding. I mean, and there's all this action. I didn't know anything about central banks at the time nothing, which most people are in that position, and as a finance professor also. So I wasn't a banking expert. There's a lot of silos inside economics. And um, so I just went looking into that silo of banking, and that's, that's a rabbit hole. And I, all of a sudden, what I knew was kind of denied. I mean, it was, things were being said I couldn't understand, and I had no idea what happened. Uh, and then it was like, why are there so many nonsense in banking? And what is, why are you saying this or that or the other thing? And in some cases, it was because people didn't understand the issues. They didn't know which side of the balance sheet we're talking about. They didn't know any of the basic, uh, they didn't ever took a course in corporate finance. I mean, I thought everybody understands corporate finance, but it's not true, and not even in economics. And um, and all of a sudden, I was in a world in which I didn't understand what people knew. I didn't understand what people wanted to know. I didn't understand why people were saying what they were saying and why they were having impact where they shouldn't. And that was where the politics came in. Okay, so we, we'll get into all the things that you're referencing, hopefully, in the next few minutes. But Ke Kevin, let me bring you in. Like, you, you were at the board as a governor, when, when the financial crisis of 2008 happened, you have a law background, you have worked in Wall Street, and pretty much were the architect of many of the policies that were formulated to save the world from a bad recession. Uh, and how did you see politics shaping anything you did, uh, and really like any of the policies that emerged? because we'll get to whether those policies were successful or not after the fact. So uh, first of all, thank you, um, Jean Min. Thanks for the kind introduction. Amit, thanks for having me. This is as close to an actual banker as a knot will ever get. <laughs> so Not true. I was. My, some of my best friends. So I was a banker. I was a, I was a banker coming out of uh, graduate school and served in banking for six years. And uh, Anat still talks to me. She even invites me to her class so we can have a spirited, spirited discussion. Um, so, so the topics, I guess, are power, politics, and banking. I don't know anything about power. I know preciously little about politics. I know something about banking and economics. And so when we use words like power and politics, another way to think about that is these are rational actors in an ecosystem created by our government policy and they're doing what one would expect them to do given their incentives. 
So when we talk politics in 2024, we might think partisanship and we think of our favorite political actors and who we loathe. That's not really what this is about in my sort of economic framework. This is about a system created and reinforced through a series of crises and that people act in the interests of their entity, their institution, their stakeholders, their constituency. So we can load it up with words that make it sound like good and bad, but really there's a system. And it's a system that our government's gone a long way of creating. Um, Amit, to your question about 2008. So uh, I arrived at the Fed in uh, 2006. It was a reasonably calm moment before, before the world came under huge amounts of pressure. And uh, we did extraordinary things under Chairman Bernanke's leadership. And I would say in some sense, the decision we had to make in the crisis is do we recognize it's a crisis, which I think we did a little later than we should, then do we take extraordinary actions as the economy is falling into a deep recession, as the unemployment rate is surging, as the banking system reveals itself to be insolvent, something that was not thought to be at all plausible the day before the financial crisis. And even a year or two into the financial crisis, it was thought by many of our friends around the world, well, that's because of those American subprime mortgages. We're just fine in Europe. We're just fine elsewhere. Turned out not to be true. The global banking system was insolvent, and the last people who knew were the regulators that were responsible. Admit we can talk about it a bit more in detail, but then what was crafted in the years since was what I believe they described as fundamental reform of the banking system to ensure that this never happens again. And I think on that, um, the, the, the results are less than were hoped. Okay, why don't we dive uh, a little bit in to look at various elements that both you have uh, touched on. Uh, so Anath, in the, in the book, uh, you talk a lot about banks, and uh, uh, Jamie Dimon in particular, you, know, you start your book with a quote where Jamie Dimon in 2011 said that the whole world was being very unfair uh, to bankers and complaining to bankers, and you know, recently he was again in a, a hearing in 2023, December, and he said, quote, bankers are good people. Uh, I look at uh, the profits of big banks. They are record profits. Uh, they seem to be all doing very well. So what's the problem? <laughs> so the question is, they're doing very well, but you know what enables them to do as well as they do? And the little secret is uh, they have enormous privileges uh, in the economy. And they don't like to admit it that way. They're all here for us. But, uh, you know, we have an epigraph in the last chapter about how all the people who have very brutal ways to get power always tell you that it's all for everybody's welfare. Um, and uh, we need to be more skeptical, said the German economist in 1940. So when you look at it with slightly skeptical eyes, you know that, for example, we were discussing today something that is just in the news right now, which is, as we speak right now, the Federal Reserve has a lending program to the banks where um, they can borrow um, for a year uh, at 4.87% uh, interest, but then they can just turn around and put it in the Fed in reserves on which they get 5.4% on reserve balance. Is that easy money? Is it easy to be profitable when you can make arbitrage profits like that? So sure enough, they do, as Kevin says, what we teach them to do, maximize shareholder value, maximize stock price. And uh, you know there are a lot of opportunities to do that all over the place. And why it's so easy for you to raise money and why it's so easy for you to never default, even if you're insolvent, that's the safety net that we've surrounded the banking system with that is sort of operates in a combination of institutions, central banks, government's deposit insurance, uh, a whole system. And you put in the other enablers of it, the auditing companies, the um, credit rating agencies, you know, on and on, a lot of enablers. And you see how they get away with it, basically. Sets. All right, so, you know, if you, if you think about banks, uh, for those who don't know how banks work, there is a, a huge amount of deposit 
uh, funding that finances a bank and uh, deposits are subsidized. So what you're referring to is that there's a lot of subsidies they get on the deposit side. There are other ways in which they can make arbitrage profits. And it's not clear what's the value add potentially that all of this is bringing in with all of the subsidies. Now, let, let me ask Kevin this because you know one of the uh, one of the angles and thinking behind all of these subsidies is that look, banks are special. They are important because uh, you know if they are not there, then making these loans from uh, and channeling funds from savers to users is really hard. Uh, they are a very important intermediary in the middle. So we got to make sure that. Whenever there is a problem in the system, uh, this could have negative externalities, so we got to subsidize it, right? So then there are externalities, we got to subsidize. And the question is, are these subsidies working? So when you look back at 2008 reforms and getting back to the record profits, because 15 years down the line, it seems like we didn't have a major crisis. Yeah, we had this issue in Silicon Valley, but who cares about that? Uh, but really, if you look at the big banks, they are stronger than ever. Uh, and so what's the problem? So you, you, your reforms worked? So, um, so I, w I, I don't think the two, I don't think the 2008 reforms I would describe even among this uh, cone, of, cone of confidence as my reforms. Uh, I have this old fashioned idea about regulation and supervision. And it goes something like this. Being a good regulator is really hard. You can send hundreds of people to the largest bank and they're gonna miss stuff. If you send hundreds of people from the Fed and the OCC and the uh, FDIC and state bank regulators, and you give them long checklists, you ask them to fill them out as they've been asked to be filled out since the 08 financial crisis, that would, can be a useful compliance exercise. But it's unlikely to get at the core issues of the riskiness of the bank, the key controls, the key decisions that they make, it really becomes compliance. Uh, most of the reforms that were put in place in 2008 struck me then and strike me now as antithetical to what prudential oversight looks like. And a simple version, I would say, because being a regulator is hard, we need three pillars. You need uh, regulatory discipline, which I would describe as one way. When a bank gets in trouble, you need one throat to choke. So tell me the regulator responsible for that bank, make sure the whole world knows they're gonna be a better regulator because they're gonna be accountable and responsible. In the 2008 reforms, what we did is we separated regulatory accountability among a grab bag of regulators with overlapping powers. So you're 0 for 1 in creating regulatory discipline by having this mishmash. Second key standard that should have been put in place in 2008 besides regulatory discipline or capital standards. My view, I don't know if, if Anat shares this view, is you should have simple, clean capital standards that are comparable across institutions so the world can see how much capital they have in plain English and you could compare those institutions to institutions overseas. We've seen a complication of those capital standards so they're almost impossible to compare with different definitions and neither a depositor nor a big counterparty could really know who's got how much capital. So the capital standards were 0 for 2. But again, I think this is difficult, so you need uh, belt and suspenders. What's the third pillar that represents good oversight? Market discipline. Markets aren't always right. You know, one version, my preferred version of the efficient market hypothesis is markets are always wrong. That's why prices keep changing. So you need markets to be able to help regulators, help counterparties, understand what's happening in these institutions. If you read the 10K or the 10Q or annual reports of these big institutions, it's almost impossible to know what are the real risks inside that business. Um, I'm not an expert on retail, but I went through the exercise of reading the annual reports and quarterly reports of Walmart. It's very clear where they make their money, what's profitable, what's not, what the risks are to their business. We, the official sector, haven't done a very good job of making sure that there's market discipline by informing, allowing proper information about these institutions. So we're 0 for 3, and if you're 0 for 3, um, you can get away for uh, during a boom time of free money that things are okay, but you're taking an inordinate number of risks. So my sense is, 
Um, at inception, the reforms called for more regulators from more institutions, more complicated calculations, and virtually no market discipline. And what's more, in the darkest days of the 08 financial crisis, and here I, I, I have sullied my hands for full disclosure, um, in the dark days of crisis, you have to do things that you wouldn't want to do in other times. We came to recognize the insolvency of the banking system. The world saw that the Federal Reserve and the US government effectively backstopped, bailed out institutions. After we got out of that crisis, we needed to cleanse our hands of that and say, we now have a system where that won't happen again and it has to be credible. Well, it wasn't credible. It did happen again. And so market discipline can't work if the world sees that there's a few institutions that have privileged status and they see 4,000 other banks that want to compete that want to get a piece of those profits, but make it very difficult. So I don't bemoan banks or any other institutions for making a lot of money. That doesn't bother me in the slightest. Whether one bank should make 25 billion or 100 billion dollars, not of particular interest to me. But when they do something that is useful for their customers and they profit by that, that's great. But when they make mistakes, there has to be a cost to it. There is a cost to it in virtually every other business and it strikes me the business of banking should be no different. Okay, so, you know, uh, stepping back, the, the way I sort of hear both of you talking about this is, look, there, there is a tension out there where one side claims that banks are special, they need subsidies because if they go down, there are lots of externalities, so we've got to do something about it. And the question is, are we providing the subsidies that are maybe more than adequate and one way of figuring that out is how much skin in the game should banks have uh, on their own. So this is known as equity. This is the debate on capital reforms, which Anath was referring to. Uh, when I was 10 years old and deciding to become an academic, uh, someone told me that, look, academia is great because uh, there is competition for ideas and right ideas win. This seems something that we should be able to resolve. What's the problem? So, Anath, why have academics and experts not figured this out? Well, they found ways to justify the statement that banks are special. And they found a way to reverse engineer the statement that banks are special by saying that uh, you know, what we see out there must be efficient because that's what we believe the world produces, while ignoring the ways in which it's inefficient and the ways in which markets don't work and the way they don't work is depositors are not in a position to know who's strong and who's weak and it's not even efficient that they do. So we created deposit insurance so they don't run to the bank every time they're nervous, okay, because they don't, they just want to do their other things. And then uh, we um, protected more and more and more uh, investors in banks to the point that they don't want to have any equity funding. And if they do, so if they have a few equity, then the equity makes, makes a bundle. And as a result, I'm not bemoaning people being profitable, but if you're profitable on subsidies, you're distorting the entire economy. Maybe it's possible that uh, the too many people, smart people going to banking relative to other sectors. Maybe it's taking too much out of the economy and living well for itself uh, while we could get these services more cheaply if only they were in markets. And in markets is probably equity markets more because equity markets will look at the downside. Equity markets will look at the opaque disclosures. Equity markets will punish them for the risk, for their opacity. And that's the markets they're not in because they're able to take assets, pledge them as collateral to short-term and depositors do not have collateral, so the assets get completely encumbered by being pledged to short-term repo and other and, uh, investors. And uh, then all of a sudden, there's nothing there. If the day comes, the FDIC would have nothing. We have federal home loan banks. We have safety net from here to, to everywhere. And you have a very coddled, privileged sector uh, that does not live by the markets that I know in the rest of corporate finance, um, that does not obey basic, basic disciplines by, by markets at all. Why academics tolerate it? Because you want to belong to that crowd that uh, thinks that they're special. I was, apropos special and converting deposits, I was once invited to uh, 
I do hang out with bankers, and I was invited to give, uh, to give uh, occasionally. Um, I mean, I have friends who I get together privately, but they, I can't reveal their names. Uh, but, uh, but I was invited to, uh, to a, a, a session, private session, with supervisors in Europe, in the entire European Union. And um, there was an ex-banker there who's now a bank supervisor who raised his hand and said banks are very special because they convert people's savings into you know, loans and investments. And I said to him, do you know that every corporation transforms investors' money, transforms into some assets? Do you know that lots of companies have illiquid long-term assets? What's so special about banks just because they happen to be funded the way they're funded? You know, corporations need to respond to investors. So in my basic corporate finance hat, it's a rabbit hole. Okay, so, you know, my own experience having worked in banking for longer than I, I should have is uh, that uh, uh, a lot of this has to do with, in academia, we had models fighting other models and uh, all based on assumptions which, you know, all seem plausible or implausible. So it's typical academics sitting in ivory towers and kind of rationalizing things that are they're seeing with some assumptions and some model. Uh, the essence of teasing this out in academia would have been the use of data, availability of data. So Kevin, you were inside the system where data is available. I'm sorry for putting you uh, on the spot, but w why did the truth not come out looking at the data inside the Fed to figure out what's true, what's not true? You guys all know I knowingly signed up for this. This, is, <laughs> this was not a coerced thing. This is a, this is a, a man of free will. And, and, and look, at bankers dress like me, and they sound like I do. Um, so so um, the closest parallel um, to what Anat describes in banking, of which, I, what do we say kindly? We, I concur in part, I dissent in part. Again, I don't, dis, I don't, I'm not surprised or somehow troubled that rational actors that run banks take these rules and serve their interests broadly defined. Um, it's we in the government. I was in the official sector for 10 and 11 years. The official sector are the one who describes these rules. So I think Amit's question is, well, with, with this at hand, why did we end up back in, back in problems? I'd say um, one was this idea that you heard before, which is banks are special and different. I'll give you a second, which is the US looks around the world at other major Western economies, and they ask themselves, how do they run their banking systems? The United States here has been, for most of the last 100 years, but not recently, an outlier. Most major economies around the world have a handful of large banks atop that have a close relationship with the sovereign. That is, their funding costs for the French banks look a lot like the funding costs of France. The funding costs of the Chinese banks look like Chinese funding, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, most of Western Europe. So really the post-war model for banking was a few large institutions that have one foot in the private sector and one foot in the public sector. That is an anathema in my view to the American experience. The success of the US economy, separate and apart from banking and finance, was dynamism, success, failure, try again, raising new capital, um, getting the fruits of your rewards, even uh, egregious profits, if you're able to do something and meet customer needs. We call that revenue. Um, we call the gains shareholder value. But I think through the 08 financial crisis, there was at some level among some policymakers some view of maybe overseas they've got a better model than we do. After all, in the darkest days of the 07, 08 crisis, I still have the scars uh, to tell about it, we didn't have conference rooms big enough to invite all the CEOs of 4,000 banks in and say, what do you know? Give me your data. Let's figure this out. We're going to decide and we go out with a, new show, with a new idea. And there was a certain degree of envy if you looked at London or Frankfurt or Paris or Tokyo. They could take their institutions, have a small room, have a bit of a discussion and be done. And so I wonder, 
I'm not in the business of assigning uh, intentions, but I wonder whether the mental model didn't change for a lot of policymakers. Maybe we should just have a few large institutions at the top. We'll tell them what to do, having heard from them, received their data, and it'll be cleaner and easier, and if times get tough again, we have conference rooms big enough for them. Well, we have seen a migration of assets from the small banks to the largest banks that has accelerated from the 08 crisis until recent days. Um, in some sense, the larger institutions have more scale and more scope. And again, I don't blame them. I blame us in the official sector. There's a couple of thousands of banks who I think wake up this afternoon and ask themselves, well, but what business is left for me? Because the largest institutions fund themselves like they're the US Treasury. They're particularly good at figuring out how to, how to understand the system. But the rest, which I would say are called the core of the American banking system, small and medium-sized banks provide credit to small and medium-sized enterprises, which in one day will grow up to be big ones and be our largest employers. And what concerns me most is that they are disadvantaged in this system. So we can compare all the best data that we get, but we really have some institutions that are implicitly backed by our government, much like the case around the G20, and a whole range of other institutions that aren't. So if you fast forward to March of 2023, when we had Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, the Treasury Secretary, with very few choices, basically said that she and the US government would bank stop all deposits. She went, I think we're supposed to say, to the edge of her legal authority to make that judgment. That is not what the law explicitly says, but it was a crisis. I also am sympathetic to government officials in times of crisis. What I'm decidedly unsympathetic about is what we do between crises. In the long period between the 08 financial crisis and the 2020 pandemic, even in the few years between the end of the pandemic, the worst of it, and the banking crisis in March of 2023. Uh, much to the chagrin, I think, of, of partisans on both sides, I'm not one who says, well, we should just sit on our hands and let the system burn down, nor am I one who said we should command and control the US banking system because they're important. What it should be is when we have a crisis regime, we have to make decisions that we wish we didn't. But the moment it's over, we have to change the paradigm immediately and be very clear. We have a duty to speak clearly to everyone, but what just broke? And I'm afraid we haven't done that. So we're stuck with a banking system that is lurching toward the French banking business model, the Chinese banking business model, which here, this is a loaded word. So for those that are triggered, be careful, that are quite anti-American to how the US economy has been strong and prospered for the last 100 years. Okay, so uh, since you brought up uh, March of 2023, so Anat, uh, I want you to chime in here. Uh, central banks are supposed to be looking at all of this, they have the data, they have data that comes from supervision, but if you look at, for example, any crisis, small tremor, immediately the narrative that emerges is, this is a liquidity problem, right? What, what is a liquidity problem for those who don't understand the word? Well, uh, banks are special. Uh, if we don't save the banks, this you know, channeling of funds from users to savers is gonna be disrupted and it's gonna be disrupted in a way that is gonna be bad for the economy. So a shortcut way of saying that is there is gonna be a liquidity problem. If you looked at the banks that went into trouble, they went into trouble because they were investing in treasury bonds uh, where the interest rates went up and their value fell. Uh, that is not the definition of illiquid assets or illiquidity. Uh, yet you have central banks coming out and saying that this was a liquidity problem, completely unchecked. So what's going right or wrong with the central bank, Anath, and why? Well, the central bank has power. The central bank likes to have power. The central bank has authorities that have to do with this word liquidity. Uh, and so they start having a liquidity narrative on everything. So the narratives coming out of the crisis per Jamie Dimon to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission is essentially stuff happens. That was his narrative. Other narratives were just a 100-year flood. It's a, it's a liquidity problem. It's just a run and a panic. And this is the kind of narratives they invoked again after Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank, where not seeing that word insolvency in the dictionary at all. 
because that's not fun. Insolvency is a much more difficult thing because somebody's going to lose. And a liquidity problem is just you forgot to go to the ATM. So a liquidity problem is just you can't convert your assets into cash right away, and, but you have a very lot of assets. Solvency problem is where you're unable to pay. It's a tricky concept, but that's where serious problems start. Well, they never want to admit to a solvency problem in banking. They always like to kick the can down the road. So, you know, to your, your language about the U.S. system, we did have crisis in savings and loans, for example, where insolvent banks were allowed to persist for almost a decade, looting in a situation with 15% market interest rates and 6% paid on mortgages, a train wreck waiting to happen, and here we are again, never seeming to learn the lessons. So between all these crises, and they, they, they were crises before 07 to 09, you see that they're always getting, they're just always wanting to forget what just happened and not do what needs to be done. And there's this willful blindness around the system everywhere. People don't want to see risk. People don't want to see problems. It's just nicer to look at the world with, uh, you know, the glass are full and the optimistic lanes, just like our discussions, you know, with Bethany McLean or other guests that we had. It's better to, to hype. It's better to hope. It's better to glorify than to look at reality. So truth loses out because truth is inconvenient. Okay. So, you know, j just uh, for record, I'm not trying to create friction between Anath and Kevin, uh, <laughs> but you know, maybe it's coming out like that. So let me do the last you bit. Yeah. Uh, I'll try again. Uh, let, let's go to the last uh, segment before opening it up for q and I'm sure that audience has a lot of questions. Uh, so the last element that I really wanted to talk a little bit about was the public or taxpayers. Uh, it's clear that a lot of discussion here has been about subsidies. Uh, if I take your word, what has happened is we have gone from a system from 2008, we save this financial system, but fast forward, we have made uh, the system uh, even more reliant on subsidies, if you will. Uh, and Anath, in your book, you, you talk about this, uh, but yet uh, the public is not outraged. If I remember 2007 crisis, uh, uh, there was a lot of outrage on, okay, we don't want too big to fail, we don't want these subsidies. Uh, none of that has happened in the last 15 years. Uh, if you look at the election time that is coming out right now, there is absolutely zero mention of any of this. In your book, as you've expanded the version, you've talked a lot about democracy mm -hmm. and links to this. So w why is public just silent? Like, is this media? Is this academics, experts? What's going on? So the problem is that the issues are a little bit technical, not that technical, but a little bit. So it's easy to get confused about what's happening, and the public gets very confused, and the public gets very misled by banks saying, oh, if you take away that subsidy, I won't make you a loan. And so the banks are able to threaten uh, lots of people, uh, businesses and individuals, that they won't make a particular loan, even though, of course, when they get the blanket subsidy, they'll do what they'll do. Uh, they'll invest, they'll chase returns, uh, all of that. They'll minimize as much as the equity they have to put in anything uh, to jack up, uh, juice up these, these returns on the upside because the downside is not, not too bad. Meanwhile, you know, you get a bonus or whatever. So they're doing quite the rational thing for themselves or for their, their shareholders. And the public is unable to really sort this out. I mean, we wrote this book because after a year of being in this debate, it was clear we, we, we had a complete wall. And there were a bunch of academics involved in this in 2010-11. We were sending letters, organizing petitions again and again, some, trying to talk to policymakers, not to the public. The book is written for the public because without the public understanding, but then they have to want to understand. They have to want to do something about it. There are lots of issues out there in our democracy to worry about. Uh, you can't win this. So when I approached maybe writing another, another edition, and for the last five years, I was too sick of banking, and there was nothing to do about it, so I kind of left the field. Uh, I was very post-traumatic about it because I think I, you know, maybe was irrationally hopeful that truth can win, but 
that was dashed. And so why would I go back into a place of trauma like that and go back to, to writing about it? Well, meanwhile, I had more interest in democracy and injustice and other things like that, corporate justice, corporate settlements, why people don't go to jail. All of that is in the last chapter of the book. So we looked more into that. But about banking, I was told, uh, so part of what I didn't like about leaving is that you know, they got what they wanted, which is they wore me out. Now, most of my colleagues, they would just like, this is too political, this is too unpleasant, this is too hopeless, you know, forget it. Uh, and so I kind of stuck longer than others, but, you know, here I'm coming back. And I didn't like being worn out. Uh, so it's like, okay, I will try and I will try to adjust my expectations to, to zero, like nothing. And, you know, how I spent my weekend, is uh, no social plans, no big, no, just my, my, my one dish hike, um, only two days, um, writing comment letters again. And it was very Groundhog Day. Here I am in front of the computer writing to the regulators again about Basel Endgame, which the banks have been lobbying with incredible and threatening to sue with incredible investment never seen before in my 14 years as much lobbying as this, a mess of a fight over complicated rules, and they weaponize the complexity precisely to make these threats. So the political game is a spectacle. The hearings on December 6th that was already mentioned was a, a complete spectacle of nonsense and politics, like you, you, know, you, you have to study what happened there. Senators explaining to the public false, that we're talking about money on the sidelines that can't be lent when we're talking about equity funding, confusing the two sides of the balance sheet in the most basic of ways, explaining this to the public, the average American sitting in front of the television because they have nothing else to do. That was a senator, a ranking member of the banking committee explaining what we're talking about. Okay, then you go to the, uh, to the um, website of the Bank Policy Institute, the main lobbying for banks. And they have an explainer called Capital 101. If you click on Capital 101 and you're an MBA student and you listen to that and you take it into your corporate finance class, you will fail. <laughs> because they are telling you that equity is expensive because it's risky. People got Nobel Prize debunking that in the 50s. So the truth has not reached banking till today, and they, and even textbooks in banking, there, including by somebody who is at Columbia, uh, seem to have not figured out the basics of leverage and risk, risk and return that were bread and butter to my corporate finance teaching. So, you know, uh, one way of sort of saying this is, if, if you don't understand the nitty gritties, is if you look at the narratives being spun out there, it's like, hey, don't cut our subsidies, uh, which means don't ask us to raise our own equity. Uh, why? Because if you do that, uh, it'll lead to lower lending, uh, especially for minority borrowers, right? So that appeals very quickly to the public. Never mind the fact the reality is that in the last 15 years, banks have been totally out of lending to minorities. It's non-banks, fintechs, which have been doing that lending. But there is no one out there to correct this perception or be on the other side because banks have lobbyists and so on, which is what you're getting at, and therefore it cuts to the democracy. So Kevin, you get the last question before I open the floor because this is supposed to be very simple. Uh, so how, how do we deal with all of this? Because, and, and I'm asking you because you are known to have taken strong stance in the past against the narrative inside the group think that was happening at the board and among the policymakers, most famously, you, you didn't like the idea that we were keeping QE going and the interest rates low because it would show up at some point in the future, and it did. Uh, we are bearing the cost of that. So how do you solve this situation? I mean, it should be easy for you. How do we decouple politics? How do we end bailouts? How do we fix the narrative? So you, you have so two I, minutes to I, I, tell us. I, I've got a much more optimistic way to end this than, than that. Um, I think the American people actually have this all figured out. They might not be experts on the Basel endgame and on the difference between a risk-based capital ratio that's done in some Swiss subcommittee. 
versus the Fed's preferred benchmark for risk. They might not fully appreciate the subsidies and the intra, uh, the, in, the links between and among the central banks and the banks and the consumer, but at some level they know that they've gotten the raw end of this bargain. The US economy over the last eight quarters has grown around 3%. Three quarters of the American people think the US economy is in recession and going to get worse. 78% of the American people think the economy is on the wrong track and that Washington is not looking out for them. Regardless of your politics, regardless of how you will, will describe each of these voters, Democrats, independents, Republicans, the American people actually have a sense in their gut because they're smart, not stupid, that somehow the system isn't working for them. They know that the long period from the 08 crisis till now, which has been popularized mostly by free money, has been very good for those of us that own assets. The stock market has been bid up because the central bank was there with a the put. But 52% of our fellow Americans have a balance sheet of zero or negative. They're living off of their income, not their balance sheet. And their income has been eroded in most of the last 24 months by a surge in inflation. They're not experts at price stability and the uh, CPI index, but they know they're falling behind. So at some level, the American people are very frustrated with this. They get everything that my colleagues just said, and they get it without nuance. They get it very clearly. The question they have to make is, well, if this is how it's going to be in Washington in banking and finance, and Washington won't stop that, then we want subsidies too. We want subsidies for our friends at the Detroit Three. We want subsidies for our manufacturing facilities. If we're going to run this economy the way that certain Western economies have run theirs, then the subsidy should be for everybody. Um, and so I actually think the American people have figured out the political question, I'm not an expert on politics, the policy question is are we going to take the core tenets of what made the US economy stronger, more dynamic, more resilient, more able to take shocks for most of the last 100 years and push that aside and adopt a different economic model with more command and control, more power for bureaucrats, more power for central banks, or not. Again, my view, just putting my cards on the table, is the moves we're going down broadly, not just in banking and finance, is the Western European economic model. And it says, we don't want any of this dynamism. We want to hold on to what we've got and just see whether we can't milk this for another generation or two. That's not my view. The 21st century can be America's century, but not if we follow a Chinese five-year plan. The 21st century can be America's century if we go back to rewarding success and punishing failure, and the business of banking and finance should be no different. Perfect. So not sure how we do it. I don't think I got that answer, but I guess two minutes was too short for that. Uh, let's open it up for some questions. I'll pick on whoever raises their hands, and then please keep the responses short because we want to cover a few. Uh, why don't we start there? The door. Um, I have a counter argument to flawed claim four, and I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts. Yes. Uh, you but just to, to tell read what is flawed There are 44 claims. flawed claims in this document. They're pilot. Yeah, <laughs> what to, is flawed claims? That's claim? the latest. To read, uh, to read it out um, loud. It says, equity funding is expensive. Therefore, equity requirements must not force banks to have too much equity. And then you go on to explain how changing the, sh the, the mix between equity and debt will make the balance sheet healthier and therefore it should reduce the cost of the equity. Uh, however, the creditors to banks, the depositors, is extremely cheap debt, right? And even changing the shift or even shifting the, the mix a bit will make the cost of capital of banks more expensive. And so I think, yes, there are benefits in having a healthier banking system, but the American public or the consumer should also know that the interest rates of their mortgages, personal loans, small business loans will increase because the cost capitals of the banks will increase as well. So, so let me, you know, it's a longer explanation, but I'll try to give you a short, a short version of it. A short version of it. Okay. If deposits are cheap, cheap, it's because somebody else is covering. I mean, whatever is cheap, somebody's the risk or costs will shift to somebody else. And that is true if you pay more taxes, then somebody else pays less. If you pay less taxes, somebody else pays more. So subsidies are to be allocated, to be given directly to whoever needs them. 
Deposit insurance is supposed to be paid for by the taking bank. There's supposed to be fees that are risk-based. As it is right now, the model that I have in my head of deposit insurance, why deposits are cheap, because it should be that you're just paying for insurance like you pay for other things. So there's no subsidy in deposit insurance, uh, except when it becomes bigger than what it was meant to be. The way it works in the US is the largest banks have unbounded implicit subsidy that they don't pay for. The smaller banks are basically the cheap deposit insurance for them is paid for by the largest banks. Because when FDIC needs money, it goes to the large banks, which is what it's doing right now for the failed banks of spring 2023. Now, if it is true that privately the funding costs for banks go up, the question is what is the appropriate funding cost for the banks? Okay, and at what rate should they make loans? The funding costs in the entire economy are whatever they are. We don't subsidize the funding of everybody else, okay? So the question is whether what they're doing with whatever subsidized funding they get is what we get best by their decisions versus other ways. So for example, suppose you want to subsidize uh, first time homeowners. Do you subsidize all mortgages to all people? Our debt, Mortgage subsidies go to rich people. If we wanted to subsidize specific people who need subsidies, then we should find ways to deliver those subsidies to them, not by giving the banks cheap money and telling them to do what they want, okay? Now, they might or might not increase, the, depends on competition in banking, what they'll do to a particular rate. It's a story you say might or might not be true. In fact, I mean, so there's empirical research on that. But the point is that, you know, even in COVID, 250 economists wrote to the government, and you were there. I was one of them. You were. Uh, yeah. Saying, law and finance academics, telling the US government not to subsidize corporations, but to subsidize people who need subsidies. If you give it to the corporation, you're, you're allowing the people at the top of the corporation to decide how to use the money. And they will obviously not cut their own salaries. And they will, even if the government tells them not to, and they did, fire their employees. Why did we not get our luggage in the summer when, when it came back? Because the airlines did fire people, even though the airlines specifically got more subsidies than everybody else because they were disrupted by COVID. So There are 44 claims. We don't have 44 minutes. No. no. So I was asked about one of them. But we can talk about it more. Yeah, let's go. Uh, Iwama, about your MD, MDA. It feels very appropriate that we're having this discussion specifically after Martin Luther King Day. Yes. Um, when I think about power and politics, I think about home equity, I think about home ownership. And the fact is that uh, ownership for uh, black Americans hasn't changed in the last several decades. Um, meanwhile, you know, Chase Bank in 2020 uh, made a $30 billion commitment to racial equity, but the, contribu the actual contributions have been marginal and the uh, accountability has been minimal. So my question is, what is the responsibility of banks specifically when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at racial equity, when we're looking at home ownership, um, and what needs to be done to be to hold them accountable? You want to say something, Kevin? I have you want to start or? Sure. So, so I'd say if you want to take any private enterprise, a widget maker or a bank, and we as a society say we want to give you governmental obligations around social justice, around climate policy, et cetera, then when you do that, you're asking for them to be part of the government and subsidies are gonna go along with it. You have another decision. The government has its own rules and its own obligations, the private sector has its. Um, what if the banks were permitted to do whatever the heck they wanted and the government decides to do what it wants to do with taxpayer funding? When we conflate the rules of the private and the public sector, you can end up in the morass that Anat was talking about. So we've got to be careful as we uh, expand beyond banking to the Detroit Three and every other widget manufacturer, whether that path is really the path we want to go down. And we can ask ourselves, are the ultimate beneficiaries of these good intentions going to be better or worse off? It is not obvious to me if you have an institution with one arm in the government and the other arm in the private sector, you're going to, uh, you're going to better achieve any of those objectives. I'm very glad you asked about Martin Luther King because yesterday as I was working on my comment letter on Martin Luther King Day, uh, I decided that I will take a little break and I will read some of Martin Luther King's readings. 
the writings. He's amazing, obviously. Amazing orator, amazing writer. Okay, so anybody who didn't read Martin Luther King should, or listen, if we have listening, I was reading. I read uh, parts, it's a 7,000 word, not too long, but a letter from uh, Montgomery Jail. And in that letter, to clergy about him being in jail in Montgomery, Alabama, because of some demonstration, he says the following sentence, which I took into my footnote in my comment letter to federal regulators. And the footnote was, and the, uh, saying, what he said was, privileged groups do not give up their privilege voluntarily. And then he said, sometimes morali moral considerations, appeal, uh, you know, individual people listen to their moral and do something. But it is well known that groups are more immoral than individuals. So, you know, I was saying this in the context of you are not going to get the banks out of their own free will to not deliver shareholder value. I don't expect that. I taught corporate finance for 25 years. So I don't expect that. I expect the rules to put them in a place where uh, what they do ends up serving society. So to your point, I am completely upset from these government that we have to make democracy work. That's why it end up, ends up being about democracy. Can we make our democracy work so that the government can set the rules, so that the private sector, when they do their thing, will serve us? That's the big question we're facing. Yes. Hey, one more. Yeah. So um, I love this conversation. Um, transparency is an issue. Basel is an issue. Camel's ratings that are hidden from the uh, public are an issue. Uh, but I want to open a, a different conversation uh, uh, triggered by this uh, question. The banks are getting into wealth management. And the national banks have a pass, as Zanat has observed, in they're never, they don't have a national trust code, like a banking code, to, to uh, stick to. They have to stick to whatever the 50 states worth of trust codes are. So um, no one can audit how the banks perform their trust services. The feds aren't going to look at it, and I've written the feds. And the states aren't going to look at it, and I've written the states. So now you have the largest wealth transfer between generations. The banks going into wealth management because it's unaccountable. What, what would make the next generation of we're not talking about bank assets. We're actually talking about assets held for decades in trust by these banks and then holding on to it for much longer than they should going to this room. What, what, do you, what can the bank <laughs> regulators do to reclaim the, the uh, flexibility under the exemption that they give the national banks for trust services? So we've spent a lot. We've spent a lot of time, um, myself included, being quite critical of government policy. Um, the government for government employees has something called the TSP, the Thrift Savings Plan. The costs of the Thrift Savings Plan are one to four hundredths of a basis point per year for government employees. There are very few, very simple allocations of wealth. And almost all citizens of all backgrounds and financial balance sheets would be better off investing under parameters like this. Think about that as the Vanguard model, the Jack Bogle model, than through complicated, illiquid uh, wealth management products that separate a lot of hardworking people from their hard-earned money. Um, however, having said that, these are sophisticated people, especially as we go up the wealth uh, distribution. And if they want to make complicated arrangements with securities they scarcely understand with a lot, lot of large banks, it strikes me that our government has quite a few things as regulators to worry about besides that. 20 seconds. No, not on trust law. I don't know enough about trust law, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, so with that then, I think uh, we had a pretty robust discussion. Anath, you wrote this book. The yeah. first time it came out was 2014. 2013, 2013. then paperback. 14. So 10 years down, you've written a book that nothing has changed, has become worse. 
Uh, I hope that in 10 years, with everybody in this audience hopefully contributing, right. we won't have to write another expanded version saying that nothing has Somebody changed. Somebody else will have to write. Thank you, everyone, for <laughs> participating. Thank you.